Just saying today, the lay people were asking a lot of questions about karma, old karma, new karma, karma giving its new results. Karma. You're just saying it's kind of going around in circles a bit. When you start talking about karma, often it's sort of never ending the, the doubts that come up. Yes. And also become, <coughs> and become a question, but. Like the kind of debtors, they hang around the person like to get vengeance on them? Like, is, is that how it works? <laughs> unless they get harmed. Um, There's probably no <laughs> ghosts or consciousness is hanging around, but it's just a good, skillful practice to develop a good attitude if there were to be. Then one spread the matter, whether they are or not, is it unlikely? You know, there's some ghosts hanging around waiting to get you kind of thing. Just the right attitude. Ma manifests in different ways. It can just be obstacles as you're doing good. And it's not so much there's a, some being there to get you, it's just <coughs> the obstacles that come up generated by your karma. So a very common one is say people come to the monastery and uh, they want to practice meditation, they go to the hall, sit meditation, and suddenly they get all these pains coming up, knee pains and back pains and you know particular kinds of aches and pains coming up. As soon as they stop meditating, those pains go. If they're not meditating, they don't have that pain. But as soon as they sit down to meditate, to do good, practice mindfulness, the pain comes. A very common experience. You call that Jao Gum Nai Weng's word, which means calming debtors. But, you know, it's it's not necessarily the a being there. It's just, it's just karma that comes up. When we start practicing, then obviously our experience is affected by both the past and the current karma that we're making. So there's past good and bad karma we've made, which is giving its results, uh, which we're experiencing, those results coming up. But then you're making fresh karma from moment to moment as well. And so there's these two aspects are going, going hand in hand all the time. What uh, is the priorities in the practice for someone who's practicing what in terms of priority Yeah, of course, uh, to prioritize what they're doing, the things you're learning, and once you come into the monastery, and uh, what to spend your time doing, and so on. And that, that's something you'll naturally do. So when you begin as an Anagarika, you know, you're not going to necessarily have the same priorities when you're a Majima monk or a Tera. You come into the monastery, your main priority is first to learn um, the basic monastic discipline, so to keep your precepts, that's your number one priority, to learn the form, the monastic form, the etiquette, to follow the routines, see what you can do to help in the monastery to serve the Sangha, learn the chanting, the most basic chants, say morning, evening chants, and so on. But as you progress, say, in your Nawaka years as a monk, well, those priorities will start to change a bit because maybe you've, um, you've learned a lot of that basic thing. You know what you're supposed to do, you know uh, the basic chants, you know the basic monastic routine, the forms, the practices, so you might be slightly changing priorities, you're learning Patimoka, for instance, uh, and you're learning other chants and things. But obviously at the same time, you know, all this hand in hand with that, you're also practicing meditation. So you're from day one through to however long you live in the monastery, you're always developing mindfulness, developing your, your practice of meditation. But you might say, well, in the beginning, it wouldn't be un... Uh, it wouldn't be unusual to, to say, well, I'm practicing mindfulness and meditation as well, but you don't necessarily expect to be, because you're not yet experienced in it, to be sort of full on with that, because you're also learning these other things which you have to learn, the monastic form, the precepts, chanting, those things. Uh, but as you progress, say, to the end of your Nawaka years, then it might not be uh, unusual to 
to see your priorities slightly changed and you're putting more effort into your meditation because you've learned a lot of other aspects of your life. You know, you know the discipline, you know the chants, you know the routines and the practices of a monk. Um, you might, and your skill in meditation is starting to improve your experience, your wisdom. So then maybe you find as you spend more years as a monk, you maybe put forward more effort. You know, more hours, more effort into sitting, walking, meditation, um, and that's that's a general sort of description. That those priorities might change slightly through time. If you look at your practice over time as you stay in the monastery, well, it's not uh, unexpected that you, know, you have periods where. It seems the mind has become gathers together in samadhi and mindfulness is good and sustained. Uh, and then you have periods where it's not like that. You have ups and downs in your meditation. And there'll be times where all your, uh, the peace of your samadhi seems to have drained away and gone and you're kind of back to square one and the mind starts proliferating a lot, thinking a lot about many different things, distracted, different moods coming up. Uh, this is not to be un- this is not unexpected, but so you might say in terms of priorities, you're just adjusting to that fact that your practice is not yet even or sustain you know, your me- ability or experience in meditation to maintain states of calm uh, to develop insight is a bit uneven. So you have to learn how to adjust and see what needs to be done. So in say the period when your mind is not so peaceful and you start to think a lot. You know, over a, you might have many days where the mind is just caught into lots of proliferation and agitated thinking. Well, you have to turn to do a lot of contemplation at that time, find what helps you to uh, rein in the proliferating mind, you know, reflecting on death, using a mantra over and over again, reflecting on death, reflecting on the impermanence of your thoughts and moods, and so on. You experiment and find ways that do help you to start uh, letting go, cutting off this endless proliferation of the mind in those periods when samadhi seems to become weak, until you sort of gathering your strength together as the mindfulness improves again and the wisdom comes up uh, through experience and through effort, and then you might find, well, you've got another period where the mind does seem to gather together and you have some a uh, period of peace and calm and the insight seems to be very strong and very clear. Um, so over time it's a matter of, you know, just learning that skill that ex- uh, to, to gain the experience in how to deal with the mind when it's when meditation and the mindfulness is what going well, when we start to lose our mindfulness, what to do at each time. And that's what gives you confidence that, oh, I know how to look after my mind even when it goes, and the mindfulness seems to slip, and there's a lot of moods and stuff coming out, I still know how to look after, I know how to practice, how to deal with that. That's where you get your self-confidence in the practice coming, there's less that bothers you, or you're less worried, because you know what to do even in the worst situation, whatever's happening in your mind. Um, You can see also, you learn things like, say, living in a monastery like this, where the community is fairly small, and it's a quiet forest, well, actually, they probably, you'll probably find that causes for external proliferation, uh, the external causes for proliferation are minimized. There's not a lot of people, there's not a lot of activity. So then you've got a lot of time to see your internal proliferation. Mostly it's just your own thinking will be your number one disturbance, say, living in a place like this. Uh, so that's, that becomes your priority, or to keep bringing up mindfulness, be aware of your state of mind, seeing whether it's getting caught into unwholesome negative proliferation on and on and on and working how to deal with with that, your own internal thoughts, how to learn how to learn to bring up mindfulness and to let go of this uh, habit of, of mental agitation and proliferation. So as you're practicing you'll find there's this issue that the mind isn't always peaceful or always concentrated. Um, so you have to be willing to keep putting in the uh, effort to bring up the supporting factors for for the mind to, to develop in concentration, develop experience in, in the practice of meditation. 
and you'll find sometimes the mind does gather together, uh, unify in samadhi, maybe just for small periods of time. You have some meditate and it seems to calm down, let go of the, the hindrances for small periods of t- short periods of time. What you call kanika samadhi, momentary concentration, which gives you an idea of the path, how the uh, how the, the supportive factors of all this effort, developing mindfulness, keeping the precepts, uh, living in simplicity and so on, support um, the mind calming down. And once you've experienced some peace, you can see well what what helped helped you to get to that point. But it maybe it's not for very long; it's a brief period. So one keeps redoubling one's efforts, going back to to maintain. Uh, the effort in all these areas and you see the value of um, living in simplicity um, maybe practicing the Tudonga practices eating in a eating in the bowl um, among the cooler cloth wearing uh, patching your robes um, not seeking a lot in the requisites just being learning to be content with the requisites you've got um, putting effort into keeping the Vinaya as a way of developing mindfulness, contentment, so the mind is not going out and distracted, thinking about these things very much, and you see, well, that really supports uh, the, the practice of meditation, and one keeps bringing up mindfulness, and uh, one might contemplate um, something very simple, like the, the, the fact that we've got to die, in Maranana Sati, just reflect on death, like, you know, people used to ask, Questions of Ajahn Chah, why do, um, how do we make our minds peaceful? And often people think, well, you've got to read a lot, study a lot, get a lot more information in order to be able to practice to make your mind peaceful. But Ajahn Chah said, well, you, you can also just do something very simple, just reflect on the fact that you're going to die one day. Your life is impermanent. And when you really put your heart into reflecting on that, contemplating it with mindfulness, that can bring up this quality we call um, the Salot Sangwei in Thai, Sangwega, a sense of both, a sense of sadness in the sense that, you know, this, this life, there's nothing you can take from the world with you. you, you won't be here for very long, but also brings up a sense of urgency to practice more because the world, the, the happiness of the world and the things of the world that you're experiencing, you just won't have for very long and there's nothing permanent in that. So this sobering sadness and this sense of urgency comes that you want to just practice more. And the most important thing is making, bringing your mind to the sense of inner peace rather than getting distracted. So you might practice that, contemplating death as you've experienced moments of, brief moments of samadhi and then contemplate death and the impermanence of this body, this mind. And then those brief moments will join up into more, uh, substantial periods of calm, what we call upajara samadhi, where you might have a period of um, the mind goes very calm for you know, half an hour or something like that, quite substantial period of time, um, and you're again, you're seeing the causes and conditions that led up to that, what supports the mind unifying more often, calming down more often, um, that gives you the wisdom in daily life, how to look after your practice, how to be composed, you know, in what you say, what you do, in the requisites you use, your lifestyle, how you see how that supports the development of your, your meditation. And also you understand how insight supports meditation, and wisdom, developing samadhi, um, contemplating on the Dhamma frequently to help you cut off um, and distracted thinking and, and the defilements that might come up. You, know, you might not be able to yet fully uproot your defilements, completely cut them off, but you, you can learn how to at least um, temporarily get to the point where your mind unifies and you, you've set aside the defilements, you, you've, you could say, wisely suppressed the defilements. Um, you know, you learn that skill, so you, you, you might be able to experience um, states of samadhi more often, more often, um, and from that, again, it supports the arising of more insight or the deepening of insight and you start to see more clearly that you know the nature of the world is what we call samuti, samuti satcha, it's just 
how we are always caught into the conventional reality or the appearance of things. Um, but really, when you're contemplating developing wisdom, seeing things as an Icha Dukkha Anatta, you know, there's nothing substantial in that. All the things of this world, the experiences we can have, the material things, are just fleeting There's and, and, and very superficial. There's nothing substantial in that. And the thing that will help you to see, break through that kind of delusion, the deluded way of looking at life, the superficial um, appearance of things, is to keep coming back to the body. This is where we really develop our wisdom. Contemplating the 32 parts, or what you might call the 10 parts, where you're going through just those external gamatanas, the five gamatanas, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, back again, teeth, skin, teeth, nails, hair of the body, hair of the head over and over again to the point where the mind is really settled within the body, staying within the body regularly because of um, the practice of, of meditation, samadhi, mindfulness, and really get coming to see you know, the nature of this body is it's just made up of these parts. It's not really a, any substantial self there and our usual delusion about this body starts to fade away. Or you might go deeper into just contemplating the four elements. Similarly, getting skilled in uh, using the state of calm to support contemplating the body, the parts of the body, contemplating the four elements, just staying within that contemplation for maybe up to an hour. If, you're, you know, if your mind's peaceful now in meditation, well then you just keep it with contemplating the body for maybe an hour at a time without being distracted, without thinking of other you know, worldly things. And then you've got a real chance of the mind gathering, unifying in samadhi and, and insight, gathering the, the, that reflection gathers together. We, you might experience pity and sukha arising just from the insight that you're developing. Go back to the beginning. So we're learning to contemplate the body as it is in the present moment to uh, see it as it truly is. Some people in their meditation they can gain this special, these special knowledges, so they might be able to recollect past lives or see and understand the karma of beings, what gives rise to uh, beings being born in the different realms of existence from one life to another. Those special knowledges can be useful. They give rise to this sense of uh, samvega, sobering sadness, turning away, wanting to find a way out of samsara, this endless cycle of birth and death. Um, they can see very clearly the effect of the kalesas, which are always feeding this process of karma and then experiencing the results of karma, life after life. Uh, they can really see clearly the cycle of birth and death that beings go through, whether it's one life, ten lives, a hundred lives, or on and on. They, they can see without doubt, and oh, that's the nature of existence in samsara. You know, our kalesas keep bringing us back to be born, get old, sick, and die. And it's all fed by this clinging to this sense of a being, being a being, a person, based on having a body. You know, it's fed by craving and attachment for this body. They can see that in short, you know, the experience of every life isn't that much different, one life after the another. We have experiences of pleasure and pain, happiness and suffering, but it all just arises and ceases, arises and ceases. Every life just begins and then ends, begins and ends. So whether we're contemplating how this body in a past life or in the present life or in the future, we can see that it's just its nature is impermanent. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that lasts for, for very long. We can see this most clearly and obvi most obviously is just looking at this present life though. Looking at this body, how it changes from day to day, how we grow, grow up, age. We can see that all the different experiences we have with this body, some pleasant, some unpleasant, constantly 
arising and ceasing. We have happiness, we have suffering, pleasure, pain, over and over again, in just one life, all of these experiences are arising, passing away, arising, passing away. So really, if you just study this one life, then you'll see all the, the lives, past lives that you, you've experienced, whether you know it or not, remember it or not, they're all similar. It's really just a constant change of happiness followed by sadness, followed by happiness, followed by sadness, over and over again. So Lumpur Cha, he emphasized just to learn from this present life what you can really know for yourself in this present life and, and, and to see the truth in this. You know, he didn't encourage us to um, think a lot about past lives or future lives, to speculate or whatever, because it tends to just lead to proliferation and getting lost in imagination. He didn't talk much much about other realms of existence, you know, seeing devas and nagas and light limiters and all of that kind of thing. He's always encouraging us to come back to just focus on the mind and the body in this life as it is and learn from that. If the monks did tend to get too caught up in all these sort of things, the more uh, psychic side of things and the more speculative side of things, well, you can you can be sure very soon he'd give a Dhamma talk uh, putting things straight. We always emphasize to just look at karma and its results in the present moment in, in the life that you're experiencing right now and to see that this is the most important thing. Uh, to Also to appreciate that you know you are here right now, you've had the chance to be born as a human, you've had the chance to meet with the Dhamma teachings You've come into the robes as a as a monk. You know, this is all this is all your good fortune. He taught us to really appreciate that good fortune. Um, it's not not necessarily an easy thing to get to this point where you are in your life and to have this opportunity to practice. Um, you just don't know what's going to happen in the next life. You know, you can't be sure what your karma will lead to, and uh, so it's not that important. Uh, the past lives are finished with you, know, they've gone, so they're not so important. The important thing is to focus on this life and really use your opportunity, that they, this opportunity that you have. Um, to see that even this very life, even though you've had have this opportunity to hear the Dhamma, to come into the monastery to ordain, even then it's passing by very quickly. In Ten years just goes by very quickly. Twenty years goes by very quickly. So all the more when you consider that, then really come back to put effort into your practice. Make every day important. Make every day count. Um, of course, it's natural that you'll have doubts arise because of the unevenness of your experience in meditation. You know, today your mind might be peaceful, Tomorrow it's not peaceful again. It's these ups and downs, and that's to be expected. But when you notice that, or you, you notice, oh, your mind is not very peaceful today, there's this sort of up and down experience of the unevenness of the practice, will use that as a motivation to keep coming back to putting effort into developing mindfulness and training your mind until it starts to calm down. If you keep bringing up mindfulness, then it will start to calm down, cool down, quieten down, and, and become more still. And when it does experience this stillness, then wisdom will begin to arise. This is what will support really being able to focus the mind to see the asupa in this body, to see the nature of this body more clearly. And that clarity, seeing the body as, say, an Ichidukha Anatta, seeing the Asuka in this body, this is what helps to separate between Samuti and Vimuti in the mind. You know, this, the conventional reality and the ultimate reality that when you see it is, is what gives liberation to the mind. You're really, that really comes from seeing this, the nature of this body clearly. So you have to keep training the mind, directing it to investigate this body. You keep asking the same questions. Is this bone, are you contemplating the bones? Is this bone me? Is it mine, myself? 
has the bone that you're contemplating ever told you that it belongs to you? It's never said anything. If you're contemplating your teeth, you know, ask yourself, have my teeth ever told me that they belong to me? Have they ever said that? You know, they never have. This is just an assumption. It's just an assumed reality we put onto these parts of our body by saying these are mine, this is me, this is mine. When you investigate like this, then little by little your view will change, the way you relate to your own body, the way you view it, um, until one day maybe you know, there's a real significant change. You might experience the Gotara Jitta, this change of lineage Jitta, or the, it's as if the change of place Jitta, where the mind sort of changing its, its, its attitude, its way of viewing the body as if turning around, looking at it in a new way. Um, this can only come through constant development of mindfulness and contemplation, you know, back and forth, making your mind peaceful, and investigating the Dharma, investigating the nature of this body, going back to re-establish um, the peace of the mind, and then contemplating again, learning to maintain your samadhi, and then maintain your investigation to develop wisdom from it. All the time you're working with your five spiritual faculties, you know, sata, wiriya, sati, samadhi, panya, keeping, developing them, maintaining them, developing them, increasing your own self-confidence in the practice from that, gaining energy and the real, gaining the kind of qualities that allow you to fight and to really sacrifice everything for the Dhamma. Um, that comes through time as these five indriya, the five spiritual faculties come together. And that's what gives you the strength to maybe deal with some of the more deeper defilements, like working with the attachment to this body, uh, working with fear. You know, sometimes you, when the, when things are coming together, well then you go off and you stay in a charnel ground and you really work with your fear, the fear that comes up when you feel threatened by things. Or you just stay in a quiet place, even like this monastery, a very quiet place. You know, it's quite challenging staying in a quiet place over time, but this, this is the kind of challenge your mind is ready for when the spiritual faculties come together. When I was a young monk, I would have been very happy to stay in a place like this, where you have, uh, you know, fairly minimal duties, not so many visitors, you get many hours in most days normally to meditate. You've got a lot of free time to arrange how you want to do your meditation, how much sitting you want to do, how much walking you want to do. Um, this is an ideal situation for developing the practice. And this, this is what can lead to Magapala arising. So keep giving rise uh, and creating the causes for pity and sukha to arise in your practice, in your mind. Keep developing mindfulness. Um, and you'll find that this, the mind sort of keeps spinning or turning with the Dhamma because you keep putting effort into bringing up uh, mindfulness, directing the mind to contemplate truth. You know, this sort of turns the mind in a wholesome way over and over and over again. And this is what helps to, brings, brings us to the point where we start to let go of Kilesa. And the more it turns with the Dhamma, the more clarity it experiences, then the more it can see Kilesa as Kilesa and drop it. And so often you have this sense, you know, there's just this big competition going on between the mind uh, and sense objects and what they how they're going to affect the mind. You can see uh, this competition is going on every day between the mind and, and, and this, this tendency to just get attached to sense objects and the moods that come up. But if you can keep contemplating this body and see it as elements, see it as Anicca Dukkha Anatta, see the Asupa in this body, well, that's what brings you to, to win out in this ongoing competition. In the beginning, this contemplation is always based on Sanya. It's just remembering and thinking about the Dhamma, thinking about the body, thinking about Anicca Dukkha Anatta and so on. But as the mind settles down and becomes more uh, peaceful in Samadhi, then you know it starts. That's a basis for it to actually see these truths, rather than just be thinking about them or remembering them. It's, and it's when this happens, when the mind becomes 
calm and peaceful and one is just seeing truth, that's when kilesas um, can be let go of, can be abandoned. Even lay people can do this. Say lay people, you maybe have to work or have other duties uh, at home during the week, but when you get the chance, you travel up to the monastery and come and practice for a day or two or for many days. Um, you also have to learn how to use your time wisely. You keep developing mindfulness, whether you are at home or at work or in the monastery. Learn how to bring your mind back to the present moment and bring up clarity. Uh, even when you are working, you have to learn how to maintain mindfulness, not to always be getting caught into your moods of liking and disliking. Learn how to develop equanimity in all aspects of your life, whether you're at work, you're at home, or you're in the monastery. Learn to keep your mind in the middle. Don't get let it keep getting caught into this sense of delighting in things or averse, being averse to other things. Just keep developing this awareness of the mind and its objects and see the separation. The mind is one thing, the objects of the mind are another. Uh, just see that all the different sense impressions, mental states, all these objects of the mind, they're just conditions that arise and pass away. If you keep seeing this, keep noting this, seeing this with insight, with wisdom and, and with mindfulness, then it, the little by little you'll find a change takes place in your mind. Uh, it becomes more refined in its awareness and that refinement of awareness based on the presence of mindfulness, this is what will uh, give you insight. Um, from this insight and from this more refined state of knowing, then you get a lot more energy from this. You get a lot more metta for the, from this as well. You get this, the sense of tolerance and uh, goodwill, natural tolerance and goodwill towards other people. So all of us have the opportunity to develop these, this path, the path and to experience the fruit. It's really up to us, each individual, to put in effort. And uh, I certainly hope, I, I, I say we all have that hope, we all have, have the chance to experience Magapala. It's not beyond any of us but it, it's something we have to, to do through our own efforts and keep bringing up that effort. So, the question was, um, when we talk about, say, the Gotrabhu Jitta, this Jitta, the change of lineage between Putujana and Arya, you know, it seems like something that's quite distant and far away, um, you know, how do we deal with that? So I just answered, well, he also, he never really expected or had much thought these things can happen, can come up. It seemed for him also, when he began practicing, it seemed like a long way away, very distant, you know, to actually gain Marga, Pala, the kind of fruits and attainments that we hear about. It naturally does seem a bit distant, far away. Um, but you just have to start where you're at. You begin putting the the prac, putting the. You start practicing where you're at. So you start learning to bring up composure, restraint, controlling the kalesas, um, learning to discipline yourself in the sila, um, learning to bring up mindfulness. You just start where you're at and begin in that way, little by little. And you might think, well, oh, I'm going to be doing this for 10 years before I see a result, or 15 years. But really, you know, don't let your mind get caught into that way of thinking. It's, it, you just can't know for sure how long it's going to take. The important thing is just keep coming back to putting forth effort in the right way to bring up the factors of the path. When things come together, when the conditions and causes are right, one's practiced well enough, well, it will happen. It will happen for itself because, because all the supporting factors are there. If it's not this life, well then it will be the next life. One doesn't have to think much more than that. Um, if a practitioner is to get quick results, say, you know, we've heard the stories, but like Lumpur Tongrat was enlightened in just four years and so on, well it's just a sign that they must have been practicing much in the past. You know, they've done it to the, to the point where this life 
there's very little left to do because all the qualities and the spiritual faculties are matured and developed previously so that this life is just kind of finishing the job off. Uh, but don't let yourself dwell on that, you know, comparing yourself with other people all the time because you'll tend to get discouraged or disheartened. Um, just accept that it's a matter of our accumulated parami and, and what's gone before, how much practice we've done before. One who's practiced a lot will seem to get quick results. One who's practiced less it takes longer, but that doesn't matter. You just keep practicing. Each uh, moment of mindfulness is a step closer to the end of suffering. You know, keep practicing. Just keep coming back to putting effort into the practice to bring up mindfulness, to compose yourself, to restrain the kalesas through body, speech and mind. And every bit of effort you put in, well, that's bringing you closer to the fruits. That's bringing you closer to nirvana. You know, if, if it does happen, you know, that moment happens where you get this change of lineage, you attain uh, Sotapati Magapala in this life, well, then you'll have the thought, oh, no more than seven more lives for me. Um, but, you know, it could be seven lives, it could be a hundred lives. In the end, that's still very close to Nibbana. If you think about samsara, this endless cycle of birth and death we've been through, it's innumerable lives, so even a hundred lives is still very close to Nibbana. Um, but in the end, we know we just don't know, do we? We don't know what lies ahead, how long it will take. So the best is not to let your mind dwell on this, not to speculate, not to bring yourself down by feeling, oh, it's so far away, so hard to do, I'll never achieve it. But that's not a very skillful way to, to think. Just keep coming back to bringing up energy and effort into the practice to counter your laziness, your tendency to indulge, to get distracted and so on. Uh, keep bringing up mindfulness and this is what will bring you to the point where you start to separate between samuti and vimuti. It's, um, the conventional appearance of things and the, the sense of liberating yourself from the <coughs> attachment to conventional reality. You can never be sure when insight and deep insight will arise. You know, for me, there's one that time I talk about when I went to the hospital um, on one occasion and seeing the corpse in front of me, the mind um, went very peaceful. I had very deep insight arise into the nature of, of how we attach to the conventional reality and the mind managed to penetrate through that and realize to a much deeper level of Dharma at that time. You know, I'd actually been to see corpses in the hospital many times. It's quite a, a thing I'd done regularly as a young monk. And I wasn't expecting necessarily anything special to happen this time, but it did. Um, it was a real breakthrough for me to see through the conventional appearance. You know, you normally have the sense of this is a body, it's a male, female, it's a person, their background, the way they look, and all the sort of usual way of thinking and looking at that, that corpse suddenly dropped away to see something much more deeply and see through to the real essence, the real nature of things. I didn't plan that uh, or expect it to happen, but it just ha it was the, the accumulated efforts in my practice and the conditions coming together, the factors coming together right at that time so I had a very deep insight. And previously I'd been practicing um, very intense, intensely in a very um, consistent way, maintaining the level of samadhi, uh, upajara samadhi, to the point where whether I was sitting or walking I, I could maintain upajara samadhi. And prior to that it had been something that, you know, sometimes I had it, sometimes didn't, couldn't always maintain it. But at that time I was maintaining it very well, so the mind was ripe for insight. Um, and so that insight came up on that occasion. So you have to see that it's a matter of you know, continuously practicing and working with your own uh, skills and, how, and, and perfections, your own parami. You know, you could compare it to somebody uh, studying in a university or a college or something, you know. Most people, they have to just keep studying the books, learning the books, learning the, the, getting the information until they're ready to take the exam and they can pass the exam. 
there's always a few who seem to be able to just sit down with hardly any previous study and still pass the exam. But that's just the, the difference between people, isn't it? You know, most people, they do take a long time to study, but there might be one or two who can seem to do it very easily without much prior study. Usually, practitioners will have to take time. You have to take time to train yourself. You have to develop skills and, and to see that, that, you know, this is a, a, a long-term training. So you also need various skills and qualities that might support you in the training. We have the basic teaching of developing Sila Samadhi Panya, but on a daily basis, you're also developing other wholesome skills and experience in the practice that will help bring up wholesome states of mind. That's why Ajahn Chah he, he used to say, well, learn how to be foremost in something in the monastery. You know, we all have a different character and background and skills, but you, know, you can put what skills, knowledge uh, you have to good use in the monastery. So you might learn to chant the Patimokha, for instance. You know, you develop that skill, the effort to learn that chant. That can be of great service to the community and you actually further yourself and give, up, get, give rise to a sense of self-worth. If you do something, you complete a task like that. It's both helpful to others and you personally have a sense of wholesome pride arising because you've done that, that particular thing. Um, you might learn language so you can translate the Dhamma, so you like from Thai to English. Uh, you might learn uh, the skill of teaching others, you know, not to make sort of great Dhamma talks talking about all kinds of high and refined Dhamma you don't really know about, but just learning to speak about what you do know well and clearly to be of benefit to others. All of these kind of um, activities, they have a, a supportive um, value in the practice, you know, they give a sense of uh, wholesome joy, wholesomeness arising in the mind, doing things that are beneficial for oneself, for others, which support uh, over time that's supporting your practice. And it's worth worth putting effort into the developing these different kinds of skills. So when I began practicing, I always had this sense I was like somebody swimming across the ocean, you know, very dark, o an ocean, swimming in the ocean and it's very dark, you can't see the other side and you just don't know how long it's going to take when you'll get there. Um, but you just have no choice but just to keep going. If you're in the ocean, you have no choice. You, you, you can't just stay there treading water. You have to keep swimming so that eventually you will come to the other side. Um, so you develop that attitude. Is you know, I can't yet see the end of the path yet. I can't see Nibbana maybe, but I'm just going to keep going. And that's, in the end, that's you know the quality that will bring you to transcend suffering. The Buddha said, Wiriya, this sort of persistent effort in the practice will allow you to overcome and end your suffering.